and thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Kane. I, I teach at RISD. I'm also a designer and an uh, entrepreneur. And um, maybe you guys saw this. So uh, before I even get into what that's all about, uh, I'm just going to play you a segment from Discovery Channel from January that they ran on it. Then once I'm done with that, then I'm going to go through what we're doing at RISD with AI design, which is, in my opinion, a whole new field of design and something we want to get prepared for. Oops. All right. I gotta say, sometimes on a week like this, I get a little overwhelmed by the amount of genius that's displayed by all the inventors, but there's hope. Now the sky is the limit, but we can start small. We could even repurpose what we've already got kicking around in the house. What do you get when you mix artificial intelligence with a retro wall ornament? A viral video featuring the coolest big mouth billy bass you've ever seen. Prepare to be hooked. Alexa. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence means the branch of computer science that deal with writing computer programs that can solve problems creatively. Hi, I'm Brian Kane, and I hacked Amazon Alexa into a big mouth Philly bass. For those who don't know, Amazon's Alexa is a personal assistant that uses artificial intelligence for your home. You can ask her to play your favorite music, give you traffic and weather reports, make to-do lists, and a whole bunch more. This is what she normally looks like. And this is what Brian turned her into. I'm an artist and a designer, and I also am a professor here at Rhode Island School of Design. Last semester, we started a new course called AI Design. And the idea there was to take a look ahead and see where artificial intelligence is going. A lot of what we're seeing from these AI products are mostly boring. They're pretty sterile and bland. And there's not much that people can relate to in any kind of way. As artists and designers, we work with emotional and social intelligence all day long. That's our meat and potatoes. It's our strong point. We've been thinking about how can we make these characters and personalities. And so that just seemed to me a really a funny thing, a talking fish. Here we can see the optical sensor and the sound sensor. Alexa, what time is it? It's 1.34 p.m. So when the light turns on, the optical sensor tilts up the fish's head, and when the sound plays, it moves the mouth on the fish. Here we have the Arduino, and the Arduino has a motor controller connected to it, and the motor controller is directly connected into the motors on the billy bass. When I first got it to work and we were in class and all the students were here, the first time that, uh, that we heard Billy Bass speak like Alexa, it was a real sort of breakthrough moment because it was the first time for us that we'd been able to actually talk to an object. This video has reached thousands of hits and counting, but that's not the most important thing that's come out of this. The best feeling of being a teacher is really inspiring the students to do their own thing. And I think you walk away after an experience like this as a teacher thinking, wow, I really generated a lot of ideas and I got the students excited. I gave them a sense of wonder. Using tools like Google Vision and open AI programs, his band of pupils are putting their own spin on the world of artificial intelligence. What I wanted to do was to investigate what happens when AI becomes able to hold a conversation similar to a human. So what I did was I co-opted an Adobe software and used it to create a live, interactable artificial intelligence. I actually used my own face that's tracked onto the illustration to create the appearance that someone's talking to um, Van Gogh in this case. Who's the best artist? The best artist is Vincent Van Gogh, of course. I think we, in a very sort of Lewis and Clark way, cut a path into the wilderness of uh, these new types of characters and smart personalities when other people can follow and start really flushing that out now and bringing a next generation of products that are exciting and fun and humorous and emotional. It'll be hard to top this AI hack, but as they say, there are plenty of fish in the sea 
and bigger fish to fry. Alexa, I love you. That's really nice. Thanks. All right. So that's the short. That's the short made-for-TV version. And then I can talk a lot about uh, what we've been doing and different types of projects and and how we're approaching this. And on Thursday, uh, I've got some new stuff that I'm going to do in my keynote that's not here. So I've got some new hardware, a new product that I think is really cool. Um, I also brought the fish if anybody wants to see it. Um, we can get to that later. But uh, let me bring up my deck. So <clears throat> this is personality is the new ringtone. That's going to be the topic of my keynote on Thursday morning. And that's sort of the result of, of doing this work and this research. And that's where I think that the industry is right now. That's where I think the market is. And I think it's a new way of thinking about AI product. And I'm going to get to that in a moment. Um, I teach at Rhode Island School of Design. I don't know if you know that. It's an uh, art school in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, pretty, pretty advanced kind of place. And this course, come on, go. OK. So this course is, um, for the last five years, I've been doing, uh, I started with my friend Catherine, the, what some people call uh, wearables uh, program at RISD. I really don't like the word wearables. I like to call it fashion interaction. So we were working with this kind of stuff for the last five years, uh, integrating fashion and technology, but really focusing on the fashion side. Um, and some of the projects are really cool. Um, we've, we've, it's been very well received, both in the art and in the fashion world, um, trying to do new things. And that's a whole separate conversation. And if anybody's interested, I can talk to you about what we've been doing with, uh, with wearable technology. But this year, I started to think about AI and it's, it's, it's developing so rapidly that I really think that we got to get artists and designers out front because it's being developed by technology and corporations and they're making these awkward products and it's not, we, we got to think about the, the, the people, the humans that are using it because if not, it's going to fail. Um, and there have been a whole bunch of real failed products, especially in the wearable side um, as well as in the AI side. So we can start to take a look at that. So what do we do in the design world? Well, <clears throat> this, is, this is the typical process uh, for design. It's a user-centric design approach. Uh, this is uh, from Don Norman over at uh, the Nielsen Norman Group. And this is, this is sort of the core of design thinking. So what happens when we take design thinking and we apply it to developing AI products? And we went through the cycle a couple of times in class. So you start by empathizing which is essentially observation. It's an observational uh, process. Then you start to define, based on observations, what you think that that product should be. And then you ideate, although I don't like that word anymore. That's a real buzzword. That means you come up with ideas. Um, and then you get to prototyping. And prototyping, for me, is where it's at. And that's what I like to do. It's what I like to encourage. Because the sooner you get to a prototype and the sooner you can test it, the sooner you're going to find out if your ideas are any good. And so I'd rather go through this cycle 20 times to come up with a killer idea than spend you know, a whole lot of time sitting around a table with a whiteboard trying to figure it out. And as the old saying goes, you can, uh, you can save six months of coding. Uh, six months of coding will save one week of testing. So we like to go through it real quick. And then the implementation phase in general, um, we're not concerned about that in class because that's that last mile you know, getting it, getting it finished. So we're, we're really uh, focused on ideas. So <clears throat> as I started to look into, you know, what AI is, I suddenly realized that <clears throat> if you look at how it's been defined on the left side, uh, that's Marvin Minsky and this other fellow, Bo Morgan, that helped me with this. Uh, that's Marvin Minsky's emotion machine cognitive architecture. And his system uh, goes like, if you look at built-in reactive, that would be considered one, and then it moves up to learned reactive, deliberative, reflective, self-reflective. That's how science and computer engineering wants to think about thinking. But then on the right side, that's where we work as designers. That's persuasion. That's, that's user experience. And those are uh, Robert Cialdini's uh, six principles of persuasion which are reciprocity, commitment, consistency, social proof, authority, liking, and scarcity. And so generally, as a UX designer, we spend our time on that right-hand side. But when you look at the two of those, they really work together. 
I mean, these, when these things come together, you're going to have some incredibly powerful products coming out. Because once you understand, for instance, when somebody is interested in social proof, well, then you can understand that that's part of, uh, that's part of their self-reflective thinking. And you can start to put those together to create unbelievable experiences. This, I, I think this right here is really something that needs to be explored very, very deeply. Um, because once you, once you put together thinking and persuasion, that's, that's, an, that's an amazing set of tools. I'm also, personally, since I'm an artist, I'm interested in this idea of a creativity engine, and I think it can be done. So one of the conversations right now is, you know, can, can machines be creative? And I say yes. And um, the reason I say yes is having been an artist and a designer for so long, one of the secrets is that we know that in many ways, creativity can just be considered a set of transformations. So if you take something, you can transform it, you can reorder it, you can move it, you can invert it, uh, you can exaggerate it, simplify it, you can add something to it, you can remove something from it. And this is one of the, this is sort of an insider trick that artists and designers know. Well, you can program that easily into a computer to start just generating, generating um, infinite variations until people like it or until it works. So this is something that I'm personally interested in that's also come out of some of this work that, that, that I've been doing in terms of research. I think that's something I'm going to be focusing on for the next year or two. So thinking about AI, so I've been in this game for a while, and it really reminds me of where the web was in 1994. We've got this new thing, and people kind of feel like there's going to be something big. You know, I just saw an article. Somebody said that the first trillionaire is going to be from AI. Maybe. But back in 1994, people were saying the same thing, like, oh, this web is going to be really big. But nobody really knew what it was. You know, they were like, what do you mean? Like, how is that going to be so big? Oh, I can, I can go get some text off somebody else's computer? Like, why, why is that so cool? Um, well, now it's everywhere, and we basically can't live without it. But the products that we have now, are almost none of them were predicted in 1994. You know, when you start thinking about meme culture and Tinder, and uh, you know, all of the types of things that, that we're doing now, Jiffy.com, um, Facebook, and Snapchat, this is not the vision that was from 1994. This is one that's evolved from our culture, from people making lots and lots and lots of mistakes, and a lot of them are non-obvious. Web TV, does anyone here remember Web TV? <laughs> yeah? So. <laughs> You're laughing. So Web TV was going to revolutionize the world, but I like to use that as, an, as a perfect example of new media, old thinking. So they were going to put the web into your TV, and you were going to browse it with a remote control, and it was just the worst thing ever. Um, it's just wrong. TV and internet are different, but the TV people didn't understand that, and the internet people thought they were going to stick their internet into your TV, and it was just a huge failure. But it was the most obvious thing, and that's according to what I have on the next line. So, and that's what's going on with AI right now. So this idea of driverless cars is very similar to the idea of a horseless carriage. And I included those pictures down there below. So if you look at the original horseless carriages, they were basically carriages without horses because they didn't understand like what a car was yet. Whoops, oh, sorry. They didn't understand what a car was yet. Um, and if you look at what's going on with the driverless cars, it's exactly the same. They took a car and they stuck this thing on it and they called it driverless, but it's still the same old car. Um, so there's a lot of thinking that can go into this. Like this idea of autonomous vehicles and, and intelligent products, they are, they're fundamentally new products. They're not just a new version of something old. And that's a really, really, really exciting thing. What that means is that there's unbelievable opportunities to reinvent basically everything um, right now. So <clears throat> a lot of the new products that are coming out right now, the current designs are just not engaging. Um, they're boring, they're passive, and they're pretty creepy. So you know, if you start looking at these two products, whether it's Alexa uh, or Google Home uh, or even Siri, uh, there are these products that just kind of sit there. <laughs> They just sit there. They don't do anything, and they're designed to not be seen. They're not engaged. They don't have this thing that we call affordance. 
So in design language, we, we would say affordance is when you just know what to do when you walk up to a product. You don't need instructions. You don't need to be told what to do. Um, and it's unclear why. They're also coming from this weird tech culture, no offense. So uh, like, who put that woman in the cylinder? Can we let her out? Like, what's going on? Why did they put a woman in a thick black cylinder? Um, so I think culturally, we need to go through some therapy on that level. Um, don't speak unless uh, spoken to, you know, does, we don't have relationships like that with, with people or even with, with animals or anything, and yet we're expecting that. So we're basically building, it's kind of like digital slavery kind of thing going on, you know, sit there and shut up and don't do anything uh, unless I tell you to. Um, and from what we've been finding out, this whole idea that you have to invoke and interact with an object in that way, it's actually not very natural and it's not very comfortable. Um, I think, we think it's better to actually leave the mic on and have it be responding naturally to what's going on in the room. And that might be a little controversial because then you get this whole surveillance feeling going on, but it's a lot more natural. Um, that's the way people interact with people and with animals and with all sorts of stuff. And when you start doing that, you can get into a whole new set of relationships. For some reason, why'd they take the screens away? Oh, I'm sorry, I should just do that. Why'd they take the screens away? Screens are good. So on the right there, uh, one of my students, Esther, did a bunch of research with, uh, with Alexa and kids, and kids didn't know what to do with this thing. It, it just, it's not fun. They didn't want to play with it. It's not engaging, uh, but then when she re put it into this other device that's fun and had the screen on it. As soon as the screen was there, the kids went to interact with it. So the screen says interact with me, especially for young people. Screens are good. Um, let's bring them back. Get physical. Um, that's, so that's another, this is an experiment that I did uh, with the kids. So I took, uh, I took Alexa and I put it inside a hamster ball so you can throw it and roll it and play with it. And the kids just love that. All of a sudden, that product plus you know, a $3 hamster ball becomes the most fun thing for kids. And this is the kind of thinking that we want. I have video of that too. Um, this is the kind of thinking that we want uh, designers to be thinking about. But getting physical is really interesting, especially when you consider this whole idea of like a disembodied character inside a can. It's, it's really kind of strange when you think about these products, um, what, what's being made. So let's, let's have bodies, let's be physical. And let's, let's, uh, let's use more of our senses. And then <clears throat> the other issue is that we need new narratives. So when you think about the development of a lot of these types of products, all, like in many ways we're, we are building Star Trek, but that's a vision from 50 or 60 years ago that's passed along culturally. Um, but it's time to have some new narratives because the future doesn't need to be what we predicted it to be 50 or 60 years ago. We're here today, we can define our own future. Um, and when you start breaking away from that old narrative, and I love science fiction, but when you start breaking away from it and start doing experiments on what really works, all of a sudden you create new stories, and it's those new stories that people are really attracted to. Um, you know, the, uh, in many ways, Siri, Alexa, all that stuff is really just the computer from Star Trek that they would talk to, and it's, we have a generation that's obsessed with making that better and better and better because they wanna live that, they grew up with it, they want to live it, <coughs> or how. So let's come up with some new narratives, and that's what, especially with the, uh, with the, the design students, the college students, that's, that's what they're, they're designers, so they're really good at that, and they're projecting their images forward, and it's not necessarily, it's not dystopian, it's not utopian, it's somewhere in the middle. That's the, that's the future. And finally, can we make her go away? Um, boy, I know I keep on harping on this, but this is, there's all these new TV shows and movies and everything with like this killer robot AI. Like, can we retire her finally? Like, I've had enough of that. It's, it's a very strange vision. It's one that actually goes back to Frankenstein, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so it's got a long cultural history, but it's really preventing designers and technology people from, from really innovating because they're, we're stuck culturally with this vision. And, and it's also, People are creeped out. So they think that when you, a lot of people, when you just say AI, they're creeped out and don't want to hear anything more. So how can we make that so it's not, so it sounds cool? So 
I'd like to uh, thank you very much, but I'd like to retire her. Okay. So, user experience. So, <clears throat> that's the first thing we look at. That's the last thing I look at. So, from talking to a lot of people in the industry, what I keep on hearing is that the last mile is emotional and social intelligence. Um, the tech industry, you guys are doing amazing things. There's all sorts of incredible software and code and unbelievable hardware and all of this stuff. But that last mile, which, which will make people fall in love with it, is this idea that these products are going to have social and emotional intelligence. And that seems to be the stopping block for the industry right now. Um, but that's great, because artists and designers, we work with that all day. We wake up. That's the meat and potatoes of what we do. Um, that, that's an easy thing for us. Um, emotional design, uh, so designers, artists, writers, and musicians. So tech companies need to start hiring poets. As weird as that sounds, they need storytellers, musicians. They need people that actually understand how people feel about things and that can write story arcs and understand drama because that's going to be the key to making these new products successful. Um, and we need designers with new skills. So we got tons of people that can do Adobe Photoshop and they know how to do a web page or maybe they can make an animated button on an app or something like that. But we really don't have any designers that understand the connection between uh, this emotional intelligence and automated intelligence and consumer products. Um, it's a really a new thing. So I'm really trying to get push out a generation of students that you guys can hire and work with designers that, that actually understand this stuff. Um, and it's a whole new, it's a whole new field. Fake it to test it. So prototyping, 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 that's what we do all day long. Um, I want to get as quickly as possible to something that we can test and see if people like it. And that was this. So this was basically, the fish was basically an in-class demo on how to do a rapid prototype. So I built this in like two hours with off-the-shelf parts. It's a very inexpensive uh, thing. And I would say, okay, now it works. And then, well, how do we test it? I said, let's just take a quick video and put it on the web and see if anybody likes it. And it went viral. So I was like, okay, that's how you do it. You know, get your, don't, don't spend weeks and weeks of going through ideas and doing PowerPoints and all that kind of stuff. Build it and put it in somebody's hands and test it because that's how you know what's good. And a whole new thing as UX designers, so when you start thinking about machine-to-machine -machine communication, the user in this new world isn't always a human. So there's a lot, especially when you think about IoT with these emotional machines, they may need to talk to other machines. And so the interface that has to work for humans, but it may also need to work for other machines. And that's sort of another whole new thing that I don't think has really been thought through yet. So we tried to live with this stuff. I bought all these smart products and had them in the room and we're working with all of these things. And what does it feel like? That was my first question. What does it feel like to live with this stuff? Well, basically, when you're, all of these smart products, what you're doing is you're giving up control. And that's a whole new thing. So if you think about software, it's, being, it's been designed for the last 30 or 40 years to give you increasing control over the most tiny minutia of things that you do. Well, this new stuff actually does things for you, so you have to be willing to give up control. You need to be willing to trust it. And that's a whole different set of use cases. Like, you know, so I, can't, I, I use this, uh, there's a site called thegrid.ai. I don't know if anybody's used it. It does uh, web design for you. And the designers just freak out. They're like, I want to change that. Well, you can't. It makes decisions for you. So that's a whole new thing. And what it's doing is it's actually freeing up you to not have to think about stuff. But this idea about control versus giving up control is a huge emotional issue. The products improve over time. So you, because like with machine learning and all that, it keeps getting better. And that's sort of an odd thing. So we're used to getting stuck in this cycle of upgrading and feeling like we always need the newest thing. But these learning machines, you have to start with them, and then you train them a little bit. There's this period where you, you need to sort of establish a relationship with it, but then it gets better. So your expectation is that it's going to improve, which is also different as opposed to, like, I bought this product, and it's going to stink in, in 18 months, and I'm going to need a new one. Um, we talked a lot about vehicles, and, and I've been working with some of the different autonomous vehicle uh, people. And that's a matter of trust. And so from what I'm hearing, 
they can do this. We can make all these autonomous vehicles. We can do all this stuff. People don't want to get in them. That's one of the big problems. They don't trust it. So I, take, I would take that to the next level and say, what would it take to put your kid in one and let it take your kid away? And if you can, if, if you can solve that extreme trust problem, and that has nothing to do with bits and bytes, and that has to do with do you trust your kid in this thing is going to take it away. And we can design things for that experience. Um, but that's, that's the level of extreme challenge that we're getting at now when, when we're talking about these products. Because if people don't trust it, it doesn't matter how good the product is, they are not going to use it. They are not going to use it. Um, there's a problem of digital loneliness that's going on right now. Uh, all over the world, it's, it's actually a medical issue now. So the more that we're connected to the internet, the more people are isolated and actually not being, like social media is making people not social. So we can use these tools to solve that, but in order to do that, you want to think about things like pets, animal intelligences, friends, and you want to think about what, what people's emotional needs are. You don't need a, necessarily a, help, a helper. It's not a tool. It's a friend. Um, and that's really something interesting to think about. And then for every, every time something moves forward, there's always backlash culture. And I brought up that picture of the, the vinyl record player because they're really trendy now. And it's like, why does anyone buy vinyl records? It makes no sense, right? But they do, and they're buying a lot of them. And that's because as things get more super high tech, they're, they're yearning for that older thing. And so it's really something to think about as we're designing this next generation of products that, um, you know, <clears throat> with thinking about autonomous vehicles when they're on the road, maybe the most romantic thing in 15 years is going to be taking your date on a drive where you're really driving a real car. You know, like, hey, this is so cool and romantic, right? And, and it's really important culturally for people to think about that kind of stuff because not every, things don't always move forward. It's always two steps forward and one steps back culturally. All right. So, uh, Lokesh. He's one, of, he's one of my grad students, amazing, amazing guy. Uh, he's going to be here Thursday. He developed this, it's sort of a game where um, you can take all the different appliances in your house and you can assign them different emotions and then you can create stories between them. So uh, you can think of a stressed watch. Uh, how does that communicate with a happy plant? Or uh, how does a, what is that? Uh, it's hard for me to see exactly what's up there. Um, uh, oh, so how does an alert game controller, uh, how does that have a relationship with, uh, what is that? Oh, a sad computer. And so when we start assigning emotional states to these different objects, they need to be able to talk to each other. And this, using this type of technique, we can create a story. So we can talk about the sad computer uh, having a conversation with the alert game controller. And we can actually write out a narrative. Once we have that written narrative, we know exactly how those products should be designed and how they should interact. And there are these fun stories. And this is the kind of stuff that people are really into when you start, you know, uh, when you start showing them to people. And they can, we can, so we can reorganize this. It's a really cool game. We think that that's, it's not perfect, but we think that that's a pretty good map of, of human emotion that goes around the outside. And you can put whatever object you want uh, anywhere in there. You can invent your own. Uh, it was like an excited vac oh, an excited blender uh, having a relationship with a depressed vacuum cleaner. Like that's sort of interesting, right? So we may think of these objects as standalone objects, but they have relationships to each other and they have relationships to us. And, and that's sort of at the center of what we're looking at. So here's some of the lessons learned um, through doing a lot of this. <clears throat> so essentially, we, there's a lot of talk about assistants and agents. I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of value in that right now, even though the industry is like really focused on that. I'm seeing a lot more value in these things that are companions and friends and pets. Um, there's already so many helper things that we need helpers for our helpers. You know, it's like uh, I think the Apple Watch is designed to solve the problem of taking your cell phone out of your pocket. And so we're getting to this thing where we're like, we're searching for problems to solve for people, but the real problems are emotional. Um, they're lifestyle and they're human. Um, so I see bigger value in that, in the bottom size. One size fits all, a lot of these new things, Alexa, um, Google at home, they, 
they're, it's like one product and everybody's going to love it. But that's not really the way it works. It's certainly not the way fashion works. Um, it's probably long term not going to be that way. Like, why should there be one character that we all talk to? And that's this personality is a new ringtone thing, is that I think we want to turn these AI characters essentially into uh, memes. So there should be ways that people can create them and share them and send them. They can be characters, they can be moments, they can be events, they can be these little smart nuggets that you make and share on Facebook or Instagram or you send it to somebody's phone. Um, when that happens, I think it's going to explode and everybody's going to start to get involved with it because they can, they can be a part of it. And that's the way internet culture has worked so far. There's tons of barriers to connectivity right now. Everybody's building their own silo. But I'm sure that uh, if anybody here has smart products in their home, it's like you're constantly downloading apps and connecting things and they don't work and you're updating and um, you spend all your time doing digital gardening. Um, really need to think about how making these products all work together and that's something that I think open source can do. Um, we don't need to, synthetic emotions, we don't need to um, mimic humans because people like machines. If people didn't like machines, we wouldn't all be here. We all like machines, right? Um, so people like machines and we have relationships with, with machines and we can think about this new thing about synthetic emotions because they may be more fun coming from machines than a machine pretending that it's alive, if that makes sense, or, th or that a machine is like one of us. Dumbness is really important. Um, as these things get smarter and smarter and smarter, maybe, maybe you can think about like the last person who you want to be around is the person that's always smarter, better looking than you, is never rude, everybody likes them, they always have the right answer. Like, you don't want to be around that person. Um, so we can, we can design defects in the characters of these things to make them more fun. Um, and people will relate to them. People love humor. They love things that are imperfect. We don't necessarily need to design this thing of perfection and we keep on going. We're trying to do the perfect thing always, but perfection isn't really what people like. Um, we can make them not too smart, and I think we can program them to make mistakes, which is really interesting. So when I think when these machines make mistakes, if we can figure out a way to have them make mistakes that aren't harmful and then correct themselves, that's going to be the kind of character that we really love. Because then it's not smarter than us. Then we act, it feels more alive if it can make mistakes. And that's a whole, it's like a whole sector of things that, that can be thought about. Um, and again, so stop, stop solving problems, think beyond function. In terms of like, especially technology and design is like always, it's like fixated on this idea of form follows function. But there are, emotional functions aren't necessarily problems. Um, and it, once we get outside of that realm, we can think about this whole class of, care, of, of products that are just fun and just enhance our lives in, in interesting ways. We don't need, for instance, we don't need music, we don't need movies, we don't need television. We just love that because that's who we are. We're, we're humans. Opportunities. So as I was saying, so AI is meme. Um, that's what I think is going to hit in the next few years. It's small. It's small. It's shareable. Somebody needs to make some type of editor where you can start sending these things around to each other. Um, there's a lot of potential, especially in our phones. So we don't necessarily need to sell new hardware. We, we all have our phones, but the phones aren't that interesting as objects. So there's a lot of opportunities to take those objects and, for instance, uh, just a quick demo that I did for the students. There's a lot of opportunities to, like, you take your phone, you put it by your bedstand at night on something like this. This can have all sorts of motors and software and things in it, and it can be this little character that all of a sudden when you connect it comes alive, transforms your phone, makes it feel more like an AI product. Um, you can use existing products, microwaves. <coughs> New schema. So as these objects and experiences start having emotions or reflecting our emotions, they need to be able to communicate those to other objects, machines, and software. So I think that there is an opportunity to create some type of open source emotional markup language type thing that says, so when I walk into my house, 
that my microwave knows that I'm in a good mood or that I'm in a bad mood or that something, uh, the, the vacuum broke and so it's in a bad mood and so it can tell your, your AI guy who's next to your bed that, that your vacuum is sad. And this is really kind of an interesting thing you know, when you start to think about it. We're, we're sending tons of data, but I don't think we're sending emotional data yet. It'd be really nice if it was standardized. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities. So, you know, one of the things we do as, as designers is we look for the worst things. What do people hate? <laughs> what do people hate? And we can make it great. Um, people, you know, and it's so easy. You just look around the world. Just look around. It's an observational approach. Like, for instance, like people hate ATMs, so we can make ATMs great. Um, microwaves. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about microwaves, clocks, coffee makers. These things are already in the house. We don't need to necessarily bring in new hardware um, because they already have them. So if you're going to get a new coffee pot, why not make it a little bit smarter and think about how that works? Uh, and you can stick all these tiny electronics in there. AI celebrities, that's my prediction for the next year or two. Uh, somebody's going to make it. It's going to be either some kind of Twitter bot or some type of AI musician or some type of AI artist. Um, that's going to be more popular than the human. You know, we're seeing this already in Japan. Um, but there's all sorts of opportunities to be working there. I think there's, like, that's a big money-making thing. If somebody comes up with these AI celebrities, they're going to be huge. And creativity engines. Um, we need artists, writers, comedians, musicians involved with the design and working with these companies. And I'm seeing, under the radar, I'm seeing some of these companies are secretly hiring poets and things. They need them on staff. Um, and we need a lot, of, a lot more deep testing. And a lot of this deep testing can be done like we're doing here. Um, you, you don't have to necessarily like code some super machine. You can make it out of cardboard. Um, you can just uh, make a very simple prototype that just does what it needs to do. Or for instance, like with, um, with the autonomous vehicles, one of the things I'm interested in is uh, people are very hesitant to get in them. Maybe they'll go for a short ride, but what does it feel like to ride in an autonomous vehicle for eight hours? You know, do they start to panic? Is there this fear? And you know, if you think NASA does these long-term tests where they put people on the side of a volcano for months, we don't know what it's like, the long-term effect of living with these things, but we can fake that. Like, you can build a fake autonomous car that People don't know that it's autonomous and it gets towed by a truck and they don't know the difference. But we can get that feel of what it's like to be in it for eight hours and say, hey, pull over, I need, I'm hungry. And how does it respond to that, you know? And what is it, you know, what, what is that? And so I think there's, there's a real lot of opportunity just to do this type of testing on these new products. Because if we understand it, we won't make mistakes with it. Um, thank you. So. Uh, that's just sort of my final inspiration thing, but I have one more video to show you, and um, I'm going to bring this. Uh, it was too complicated to bring in here. I didn't know what, I, what room I was walking into, but this is the new thing that we're working on. So again, <clears throat> I was working with Lokesh, and we looked around and we said, what's, this, what's the saddest appliance? I think it's the microwave. Right? Is there any sad, right? It's always dirty. No one ever cleans it. It's always stuck in the corner, like in the back of the 7 Eleven. It's gross. You don't want to go there. You don't even want to touch it. It's like sad. Like you just feel sorry for it. So we said, okay, let's take this, what the worst thing possible, and make it the best thing. And this is uh, part, of what we, part of what we came up with. Um, I've got this here, and I'm going to bring this on Thursday so we can all play with it. And I got all these toys. Um, that we can play with. But let me show you this. You're the first people to see it. We're hoping to bring this to market pretty quickly. Uh, let me see if this works.
So that's the new thing. Um, we're working with Tenor and Clarify on that. Um, and I'm going to have that for, pl I could have brought it here today, but I, but I couldn't. And I also have this other product that um, is an, a more of an emotional comfort device. Um, so we think that's pretty cool. And it's like all of a sudden the microwave becomes really, really fun. And we've been getting really hands-on with that and testing it. Everybody seems to love it. Um, and again, it's not solving any problem. It's just making life a little bit more fun. But I think that that's what people want. Um, any questions? No? What do you, I, Yeah, so sure. So, um, uh, uh, what what's an example? It uh, I don't know if you're having a discussion with somebody, it it might answer the question for you. It might you know it might interrupt or it might make maybe it's listening and it and it knows a joke, it knows a Stephen Wright joke that's related to what you're talking about. Um, you could certainly have something like a Roomba that's moving around and kind of following you around and sort of giving you suggestions or talking to you. Um, a lot of this has been explored. So the people like at Pixar and, um, you know, with WALL-E and um, definitely with Star Wars with, uh, some of their robot characters. I mean, they've thought about a lot of this thing. They're making characters, not, um, not, not like computery robot things. Um, certainly, in the car, you could imagine uh, that it could proactively tell you that there's a gas station up ahead. Um, uh, pretty, pretty much, pretty much everywhere. But the, but the, the way it is now, you have to ask it a question. And does anybody here have Alexa, Siri, Google Home, any, any of that kind of stuff? It's very sensitive. Um, there's sort of this, just a, so a lot of these products are honeymoon products. Like you get them and they're great and you love it for a week or two and then you never use it, um, right? <laughs> Same thing with a lot of the wearables, the Fitbit and, you know, like, yeah, I used the Fitbit for a few months and now it's in my drawer and I haven't charged it. So, you know, how can we make, as opposed to things like cell phones and Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff, where people get them and they increase their usage over time, so that's, that's really the, the goal, you know, of what, from product perspective, we want to make things that people like more as time goes by, not this sort of like one-liner one thing. Um, does that answer your question? This, this is really new. So we just started this in, in September, and it's like we sort of didn't even know what questions to ask. Now I think we know the questions to ask. And there's all of these little avenues for research going out there that are really, really cool. There's also, you know, one of the other things that we look at a lot, especially on the wearable side, is like why are these products failing so hard, like things like Google Glass? Um, and th there's answers to that. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that there's all, I mean, and one of the things that's really interesting to me is looking into animal intelligences and why we, why humans like pets. Um, they don't really do much for us, and they actually require quite a bit of attention. Um, and they're, they don't behave like this. They're very unpredictable. They jump up on our keyboards and stick their butts in our faces and make a mess on the floor and, right? I mean, so we have this relationship where we actually, you need to, you need to, you need to love it in order to get the love back. And these are the types of things that I think are gonna make the, the AI products really exciting that people are gonna love. 
um, and, and, you know, so much of the tech industry is like, wants to have you not have to work anymore. But maybe you do want to work to, to these products, uh, to make them really good, because they have, they, the whole thing with, with learning, and, you know, these um, deep learning and all that kind of stuff, is you have to train it. So why not make that, like, thinking like a pet? And, and all over the world, people love pets. And that's actually this product here, which I didn't really talk about. Um, this is a uh, this is a pretty pretty simple device that um, this is part of the digital loneliness thing that I've been working with for a while. So it's right, <laughs> um, and it's a very very simple device, very inexpensive. You know, we're hoping to get this out for under a hundred dollars, and all it does is purr. So when you hold it, it purrs, and it's very very intimate. Um, it's very very simple, and it's not. It, doesn't cross the uncanny valley. Do we know what the uncanny valley is? If I say that? Yeah? Uncanny valley is where something is very realistic, but is just a little short of it, and that makes it super creepy. So instead, we just dial it back and get more into an abstraction. Um, and I'm working with uh, some folks now, because I have to make a PCB, and it's, it's getting complicated. Um, but if you want, you can, you know, how many? How many tech products do you throw around? So these are like extremely tactile, extremely physical products. Whoops. Oh, That's okay. Um, that are for, for different types of emotional needs. And we're hoping to get this tomorrow. Any other questions? No? Does anybody want to? I, I can leave this up here if you want to see the, the fish. It's, the funny thing about the fish is that I really just meant it to be an in-class demo. It's not like a sophisticated, I mean, it's kind of cool, it's an Arduino project, right? But it's not like this sophisticated hack. <laughs> and it was meant to just be very quick, but then that sort of, because it went viral, it sort of eclipsed. And I, feel, I almost felt bad about that because it eclipsed some of the students, which I shouldn't do. Um, but any other questions? Uh, so my answer to that is test, 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 and test. So come up with an idea, make this thing in a day, have somebody live with it for a couple days, see how they're responding to it, and keep going through that cycle and find out, yeah, is this like so addictive that they never leave the home anymore? Um, or is it just really help them out? You know, I mean, you know, there's all these moments in our lives where it might be like you can't have a, for instance, you can't have a cat at the office. You can't have a cat in the car, but now you can. And is that going to make us feel isolated and lonely? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But I don't know the answer, so I'll test it. Um, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, we do know now that people are feeling isolated and lonely. I mean, you go into coffee shops and everybody's there, and nobody's talking to one another. But people are emailing the person in the next cubicle over at work, right? Yeah. Do you have questions? That's a tough question. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I think it's, again, I would say test, 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 because I don't think, even with the best intentions, I don't think we know how our products are going to necessarily have an impact. Um, it's a very, it's a, it's a very, very difficult gray area. And so I would just say, um, try making this stuff and test it and see, you know, see what, what happens. Um, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of design is intention. So, you know, I guess if you keep your intention clear, I'm not, I'm not sure that my morality is anybody else's morality. So um, I don't know if you want me projecting into your world. 
I'm not the most moral person. So that becomes really interesting, and that gets back to, again, what I was saying about this, no one wants to be in the room with that perfect person, right? And nobody, does you, do you really want just a yes friend? Probably not. Um, and that's why I was saying, it should, I think it should make mistakes, and it should, you know, have flaws, and it shouldn't be so perfect, because we, we're all very egocentric beings. And uh, we want to think that we're better. Whether it is true or not, we want to think that we're better. And so with these other things, if, um, do we know the Paul Bunyan story? Everybody know the Paul Bunyan story? Yeah? Paul Bunyan, it's an American myth about um, the guy who could chop down trees and then there's a machine that can do it faster and better than him. We don't want to live with that. <coughs> so by making these funky, flawed characters, and you can think about like I said, Pixar has thought about a lot of these things because it's all about telling stories and narrative. Um, Wally is not threatening, right? Uh, what's the R2-D2 or whatever? These characters, they're not threatening. Um, so we can make things that are actually really, really cool but that don't make us feel powerless, that they don't make us feel less than. Um, I have a, if you're interested, like I've mapped out a lot of this stuff. I didn't know if this was the right forum to get into that level of detail. But in user experience, we're constantly working with that. So we, any user experience designers here? Yeah? No? Oh, OK. So I mean, basic 101, uh, you never tell people that they made an error anymore. It used to in the old days. It's like, oh, you made an error. Now we say, oh, you could, why don't you try this? Or um, for instance, so if you're filling out a form, every time you get that field right, it Maybe if you give a little green check next to it, it's like, hey, there's a little reward. Now I feel good. I did it right. This is what we do in UX. And um, if there aren't any designers here, you may not be aware of all of the very, very subtle little hints and tweaks that we can do. And that gets back to that Caldini stuff. It's, I, shouldn't, I probably shouldn't even show that because that's the secret sauce. Um, but we can work that in. And also, if you, and, and if you start mapping that back to um, Back to the Minsky model of the mind, it's like, oh, I know that this person just had a reactive response, so I need to respond to them with this type of, um, uh, I need to respond with liking because their, their reactive response to this said that they're nervous, so if I give them a liking response, they're going to feel good and get out of that space so that they'll continue moving forward. It's actually really, that, that's a very, very, I haven't even, because I've been so busy doing all this teaching, I haven't had time to, to really sit down and explore it. But that's what I'm hoping to do for the next few months. I don't have the answers to the morality and all that kind of stuff. I wish I did. The smarter minds will figure that out. So, any other questions? No? You can play with the toys if you want. I don't think there's anybody else in here. Um, and come back Thursday. So, Lokesh is coming. Um, he's an amazing uh, student, uh, and we're going to show off and have a chance to play with the microwave. Because as cool as it is to, to see a video of it, like getting hands-on with this stuff is really, really fun. Did I finish? Did I do my time? Right on time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.